Good morning and welcome to the Forum at St. Bart's. My name is Peter Thompson and I serve as the Associate Rector for Formation and Liturgy here. On this Martin Luther King Jr. Day weekend, um, when we celebrate the, the prophet who fought for justice and equality, and as we prepare to inaugurate um, this nation's 46th president, we're pleased to welcome to the forum Dan Pinello. He's professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and a parishioner here at St. Bart's. At John Jay, he teaches courses on American government and politics, judicial po processes and politics, and the law and the politics of LGBTQ rights. His books include Gay Rights and American Law, America's Struggle for Same-Sex Marriage, and America's War on Same-Sex Couples and Their Families, and How the Courts Rescued Them. Them. He is an active member of the LGBTQ plus community here at St. Bart's and leads one of the St. Bart's Connects groups. And uh, Professor Pinello, it's, it's great to have you with us. Thank you, Peter. I appreciate the invitation. Um, I just wanted to begin by noting that in years of teaching, I found that some people are more disposed to visual learning. They like to see words and other images, whereas for others, uh, listening to information is more effective means of education. And so I shall deliver prepared commentary, both by PowerPoint slides and oral remarks, because I think this approach also accommodates anyone who I, with either hearing or sight impairments. And so let me share my screen. And I hope you can see that. All right, so there's the title of my uh, presentation, a kind of long, uh, the evolution of equal protection in the US and the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Equal Protection Clause since World War II and how constitutional history and language have impeded the full realization of equality in the United States. So let me jump in with a preliminary comment my presentation is going to focus on the provision of equality coming from the US Constitution. Now, other sources of law in our complicated system of American federalism may also furnish equality protections. And I probably should stop and just explain that word federalism for a moment. Um, it means nothing more than the division of power between the national government on the one hand and subnational governments on the other, which we call states. So in our system of federalism, the federal government has certain exclusive powers, say that of conducting international relations or of uh, coining a currency, um, uh, regulating interstate commerce, things like that. That's also all given to Uncle Sam. Whereas states have their own very consequential powers. So the primary police power of uh, defining and criminalizing antisocial behavior rests with the states, um, as does uh, the enforcement of contracts, supervising domestic relations, um, and administering trusts in the states. Those are all state-based powers. And to make it even more complicated, some powers are co-equal between national and state. So both Uncle Sam and the states have the power to tax and spend, right? So that's my shorthand definition of federalism. So as a result of that, states uh, have on their own, on occasion, uh, created legislative statutes on public accommodations that prohibit discrimination based on a variety of personal attributes and other factors. Nonetheless, the Constitution is the most fundamental legal and political document that covers the entire nation. And thus, my attention this morning is going to be focused on it. So um, as an introduction, consider an important circumstance of political equality right after the end of World War II, an issue of legislative apportionment. And as you may know, state legislatures in this country are constituted by representatives elected from districts throughout the state, one lawmaker per district, with each, with each representative having one vote in their respective legislative chamber. 
And in light of this widely accepted, accepted constitutive formula, achieving meaningful political equality requires each district to have roughly the same number of constituents so that each lawmaker represents approximately the same amount of voters. But consider Illinois in 1946, where the legislature was apportioned pursuant to a 1901 state law that itself was based on the 1900 census. Now, of course, there had been censuses after 1900, of course, every 10 years, but Illinois had not changed its districts since 1901 in 45 years, and so things changed in the state. Indeed, the population in Illinois grew substantially over those 45 years or so, especially because of urbanization, with people flocking to cities like Chicago from more rural environments. And as a result, there were wide variations in population across Illinois legislative districts in 1946, so that the smallest one from a rural area had about 112,000 people, while the largest urban district in the Chicago area had 914,000 people approximately. In short, one district had eight times as many constituents as another district. And Illinois wasn't the only place in our country with these so-called malapportioned legislatures. Indeed, many other states were situated similarly to Illinois because incumbent state legislators everywhere, everywhere in this country have virtually no political incentive to redraw their own district boundaries. And guess what? State legislatures draw their own state district lines. And so if there's going to be a reapportionment, it has to be done by the state legislature itself. But if lines were to be redrawn, incumbent legislators might be jeopardized in terms of reelection by having substantially different groups of constituents in new districts. Right, so the lines you know, are drawn in ways where substantial new numbers of people are brought into a district or substantial people are excluded from a district, then that legislator may not have the same chance of being reelected. So again, there's no political incentive for incumbents to redraw their own district boundaries. So Illinois legislators and legislators in you know, Arizona and Texas and everywhere around the country had similar kinds of desires to maintain their existing districts and therefore malapportionment was common. So in 1946, again, the year after the end of the Second World War, Illinois' legislative malapportionment reached the US Supreme Court in a case titled Call Grove versus Green, where the state was being attacked for its failure to reapportion its legislature again to represent districts in a proportionate way. And the Supreme Court wrote in Call Grove, this is from the majority opinion by Justice Felix Frankfurter, courts ought not to enter this political thicket. The remedy for unfairness in districting is to secure state legislatures that will apportion properly or to invoke the ample powers of Congress. The Constitution has many commands that are not enforceable by courts because they clearly fall outside the conditions and purposes that circumscribe judicial action. For example, violation of the great guarantee of a Republican form of government in states will not be challenged in the courts. The Constitution has left the performance of many duties in our governmental scheme to depend upon the fidelity of the executive and legislative action, and ultimately on the vigilance of the people in exercising their political rights. So in other words, Frankfurter on behalf of the court in Colgrove is saying, we can't help you. Sorry, you gotta go somewhere else if you want a remedy. Go to the state legislature. 
go to the Congress, but don't come to the courts. Thus, the Supreme Court dismissed the Cole Grove case as non-justiciable, fancy legal word, meaning that it's not appropriate for judicial remedy. Again, it should be resolved politically in a, in a political branch of government like the legislature. And indeed, the majority opinion in Colgrove never once mentioned the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, although the dissenting justices did, but the controlling opinion never even made reference to this idea of equality from the 14th Amendment. Hence, just after World War II, the year after it ended, the Constitution did not remedy the fundamental equality violation represented across this country by malapportionment. So that's the setting. That's where we were in broad terms with regard to equality under the Constitution right after World War II. Now, the most broadly based guarantees of American civil rights appearing in the Constitution are in two sections. The first, of course, is the Bill of Rights, consisting of the first 10 amendments. And the second part are the three post-Civil War amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th. And keeping amendments to the Constitution in historical context is vitally important to understanding their limitations in terms of their impact. So the historical setting is very important. And indeed, the Bill of Rights itself was part of the original compact to secure state ratification of the Constitution in the 1780s, after the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787. And indeed, three quarters of the states had to ratify the origin, original seven articles of the Constitution that established the basic structure of our government, both um, primarily uh, the, the national government. And when the states were asked to ratify it, they said, well, that's fine, but we want some guarantees that the federal government is not gonna to become too strong and tyrannical because we just had this war of independence, you're getting rid of you know, parliament and the king, and we don't wanna replicate that here at home. So we want guarantees that the national government is not gonna become oppressive. All right, so if you look at the Bill of Rights, which again was part of the deal for the states to ratify the Constitution, Amendment 1 begins, Congress shall make no law re respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances, right? So it was focused on Congress not to do oppressive things, right? That's what the Bill of Rights is all about in effect. Then the subsequent amendments to the Constitution after the Bill of Rights were as follows. The 12th Amendment was ratified in 1804 and it dealt with uh, various procedures in terms of implementing the Electoral College because the presidential election of 1800 had become messy in various ways that the original constitution didn't fully answer. And so the 12th amendment had to work that out. So for example, uh, the presider of the Senate was the person who would open up the individual envelopes from the state and count the electoral votes as we might have witnessed uh, during the day on January 6th of this year, for example. Those are the kinds of things that the 12th amendment addressed. The 13th amendment was ratified in 1865 the 14th in 1868, the 15th in 1870, and the 16th Amendment in 1913. And the 16th Amendment authorized a federal income tax, by the way. So if you're employed and a chunk of money goes to Uncle Sam every year from your paycheck, you have the 16th Amendment too, to thank for that, all right. But again, returning to the historical setting, 61 years elapsed between the 12th and 13th Amendments, and 43 years passed between the 15th and 16th, whereas the 13th, 14th, and 15th were all added within just five years each of each other right after the Civil War. And so these amends, amendments were in effect a package deal and, and therefore mutually complementary. 
As a result, the Supreme Court took this historical context into account when interpreting the meaning of the three amendments. So let's look at their language. The Supreme Court observed that the language of both the 13th and 15th amendments explicitly dealt with race relations. So the, the 13th amendment reads, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime where the party who have been duly convicted shall exist within the country or any place subject to their jurisdiction. The 15th amendment, the right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude, right? Those are explicitly race-based issues that those two amendments were talking about. Now, in contrast, the language of the middle amendment, the 14th amendment, with its equality provision, was not explicitly addressed to race relations, but appears to be more broadly based. So the 14th amendment says in part, nor shall any state deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Hence, just reading these words on their face might lead someone to believe that the Equal Protection Clause applies broadly across many different kinds of people and thereby grants them equal treatment under the law. But that comprehensive approach, however, has not been adopted by the Supreme Court over the years. And so I'm gonna talk about Supreme Court Equal Protection Jurisprudence. And jurisprudence is one of these fancy, again, legal words. And it just means the philosophy or organizational structure of a particular body of the law. So I'm gonna be talking about what the Supreme Court has done in interpreting the Equal Protection Clause over time. And uh, doing so, uh, it has again been informed by the historical context of the Civil War amendments and their apparent focus on race relations. So as a result, the Supreme Court developed a fairly complicated equal protection jurisprudence that focuses on various categories of people. And the most highly protected group falls within what are called suspect classifications. And this category includes government actions that discriminate based on either one's race, national origin, religion, or alienage. So these so-called suspect classifications trigger what is termed strict judicial scrutiny and require a compelling state interest to justify the classification as being constitutional. In other words, the burden here falls upon government to provide a very good reason why the discrimination based upon race or religion or what have you should be permitted by the courts. And without such a compelling reason, the classification is automatically nullified under the Equal Protection Clause. So as a practical matter, once a judge determines that a suspect classification is at stake, in other words, it involves race or religion or alienage or something like that, no state interest is usually persuasive enough to justify the discrimination and the classification fails. An intermediate group of interests under the Equal Protection Clause are called quasi-suspect classifications. Not a terribly creative uh, name, but that's what they're called. And these include, among other things, gender and legitimacy of birth. And quasi-suspect classes prompt what is termed heightened or intermediate judicial scrutiny. And here states again have to provide good, some good reason for the classifications before they're determined to be constitutionally sound. So this quasi suspect status provides some protection, but not the same absolute level as in the first suspect category. Then there's everyone else. The third and final category of groups covers everyone not either in the suspect or quasi-suspect groups. And here's where government classification based upon attributes such as age, disability, wealth or lack thereof, political affiliation, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression or what have you, this is where they're all thrown in, where they all fall. 
And these types of classifications are subjected only to what is called the rational basis test. Put differently, if a state can come up with just one potentially rational reason as to why it created the classification at issue, then the state's action is constitutionally sound and not in violation of the protection clause. So as a practical matter, states can usually justify, at least in theory, if not in practice, most such classifications. In other words, the rational basis test has a very low bar for states to pass to overcome in order to have their classifications based upon age or what have, what have you be constitutionally sound. Now there's a further limiting factor on the Equal Protection Clause, again relating to the Civil War amendments and their history and language. So again, looking at the language of the 13th Amendment, returning to that, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States. That's an absolute and unqualified statement. No slavery in the US, period. Regardless of whether it's fostered by states or by private entities or citizens. In all such circumstances, slavery is prohibited. Whereas the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause constrains only state action, nor shall any state deny equal protection, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't apply to private entities or citizens. Hence, the Equal Protection Clause is relevant only in the public arena, not in the private sector. So for example, when Brown versus the Board of Education was more rigorously implemented in the South during the 1960s, private all-white academies sprang up there and their discriminatory presence did not implicate the Constitution Equal Protection Clause since no state action was involved. It was all private. And so the Equal Protection Clause was irrelevant to these all-white academies. Likewise, more recently, with regard to Twitter and Facebook, when certain people whom I will not name were thrown off the use of those social media accounts, there were cries of, you know, this is a violation of free speech and whatnot. Again, if you get back to the First Amendment where the free speech clause is, 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 exists, it says Congress shall make no law, right? So there has to be some sort of government action again. Congress has to do something. That's not the circumstance with Twitter or Facebook. So free speech again is irrelevant to those arenas. So consequently, the United States does not have a comprehensive equality protection that is constitutionally based. But again, as I said earlier, other sources of law may, but are not required to fill the gap. So Congress can't pay it past statutes like the Civil Rights Act of 1964, or the Voting Rights Act of 1965, or the Americans with Disability Act of 1990, or other examples that people might come up with. Congress can also enact anti-egalitarian laws, such as Don't Ask, Don't Tell from 1993, or the Defense of Marriage Act in 1996. So congressional action can be a double-edged sword, in other words. Likewise, as I said earlier, states can also provide equality rights. Now, let's quickly compare the United States with Canada, just to put things again into a comparative contrast. And if you think of our Northern neighbor, that country appears at least fairly super, superficially to be quite similar to us. I mean, we're both former you know, British colonies. We both inherited a common law system of government. So there's a lot of similarity between our countries. But Canada, in contrast, had no Bill of Rights in its national constitution prior to 1982. Nothing existed. There was nothing compared to our Bill of Rights you know, from the 18th century in the Canadian Constitution until 1982, when the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms was ratified. And there in section 15, you had this language. Every individual is equal before and under the law and has the right to the equal protection and equal benefit of the law without discrimination. 
And in particular, without discrimination based on race, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, sex, age, or mental or physical disability. So in other words, the Canadian Charter introduced this sweeping equality statement without limiting its application to government action, as with the Equal Protection Clause, it's just a broad statement of equality. And then it offers a few categories as uh, examples. And that list of categories is merely suggestive. It's not exhaustive. So again, if you go back to the words, every individual is equal before and under the law and has right to equal protection, and equal benefit of law without discrimination, and in particular, without discrimination based on race, national ethnic origin, color, religion, sex, age, or mental or physical disability, those are again suggestive. They're not exhaustive, all right? So as a result, for example, in the 1990s, Canadian courts read sexual orientation into section 15 of the Canadian Charter. So that by 2004, all Canadian same-sex couples had a constitutionally protected right to civil marriage. More than a decade before, all lesbian or gay pairs could wed in this country, in the US. So as a conclusion, the language, history, and jurisprudence of the Equal Protection Clause hinder broadly based equality in this country, in America. In contrast, Canada's more modern Bill of Rights functions far better in achieving the goal of treating all citizens in the same ways across that country. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Pinello, and, and thank you all for watching. If you have um, questions or comments for Professor Pinello, please um, insert them into the chat um, on YouTube or uh, in the comments on Facebook. You can also email them to me, pthompson at stbarts.org. That's P-T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N at S-T-B-A-R-T-S.org. Um, Professor Pinello, I, I noticed that that the kind of assumption behind your presentation is that the the constitution and its amendments have limitations that that they're not perfect um yet often in our national discourse um the constitution serves kind of as the bible does in religious contexts as kind of this this symbol of something that is flawless um why do you think it's important that we acknowledge the the flaws of the constitution and why is it so difficult for us to do that well, because with the Constitution, as, as you're saying, that's a wonderful comparison to the Bible. It's kind of like our Holy Grail politically, right? But it, it is highly flawed. And, and, I mean, even from the terms point of democracy, just the Electoral College itself, in terms of how we choose our chief executive, we've had two recent examples in the past 20 years of how that can work from the presidential election of 2000 and 2016, where the person who got the most popular votes nationwide was not the, was not elected president, right? And then you have the United States Senate, right? Where every state, regardless of its population has two senators, right? So Wyoming, which has about 500,000 people, it's the smallest state in terms of population in this country has got two United States senators. And California, which is our largest state in terms of population has about, I don't know, 35 million people, whatever it is, gets two senators. So every California senator represents 70 times the amount of people that each Wyoming senator represents. That's not equality, okay? But you know, the, the, again, the problem is we have this 18th century document that we're having to rely upon in the 19th century and necessarily anything that's old. And again, even, and I think the Bible is also a, a similar context here is going to be flawed. It's going to have things that aren't relevant to modern times. And so we have to appreciate and deal with that as best we can. Can you speak a little bit about how the, the current court looks at issues of equality? Um, there's been a perception at, at least that, um, you know, recent decisions um, looking at the, the, the Voting Rights Act, looking at issues of affirmative action have, have reversed progress that had previously been made. On the other hand, um, you know, there was recently a decision that, um, that saw the evidence for some protection for transgender individuals. Can you, can you talk about um, 
where recent decisions have left us in terms of issues of equality? It's, it's a very mixed bag. It's a very mixed bag. Yeah, so um, just that recent decision from just last June called Bostick versus Clayton County from the state of Georgia expanded the meaning of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which on the face of it prohibits sex discrimination in employment uh, by, by a vote of six to three last June in a decision written by Trump appointee Neil Gorsuch, the Supreme Court interpreted sex to include both sexual orientation and uh, gender uh, expression um, and, uh, um, and, um, and equality. So that now transgender people as well as gay men or lesbians are protected against um, discrimination in the workplace as a result of a six to three Neil Gorsuch written uh, June 2020 decision, um, which was flabbergasting to me. I mean, I never expected that outcome. So it can be kind of uh, unpredictable. Whereas I think with uh, the other two uh, Trump appointees, we're gonna have a lot more decisions that will uh, try to be more sympathetic to religious liberties. Uh, for example, there was a, a case argued, <clears throat> pardon me, from Philadelphia, uh, that was argued before the court in November after the most recent appointee uh, joined the court where the city of Philadelphia was trying to penal penalize a, a Catholic uh, foster care agency that would not consider uh, same-sex couples as uh, foster parents. Uh, and they said it was against their religious beliefs. And then since there were other, uh, many other agencies to whom these gay or lesbian couples could go, uh, the um, uh, religious liberty of this Catholic charity ought to be represented. And I would not be surprised <clears throat> if this uh, more conservative court is sympathetic to that. Although I don't think that will say in any way that you know uh, the right to marriage equality is somehow going to be threatened. I think the periphery may be uh, you know, uh, addressed in, in particular kinds of ways. So indeed, same-sex couples may have to go elsewhere for what they want, but they can still get married uh, or, and have their marriages respected from state to state kind of thing. But yes, um, this more conservative court has represented, uh, has respected the, you know, the uh, constitutional rights of corporations, right? So there are now uh, uh, free speech and political rights of you know, IBM and other kinds of corp corporations and striking down uh, the, the limitations on federal contributions to presidential campaigns or things like that, uh, that, the, um, um, uh, that the Supreme Court struck down in 2010, if I remember correctly. So it's, 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 it's been a very mixed bag, kind of unpredictable. And I think that will continue to be the case for some time. Can you talk a little bit about voting rights? Uh, we're gonna have a speaker talk about voting rights in a, in a few weeks, but I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about voting, voting rights law and its relationship to equality. Well, the, as, you, as you alluded to earlier, the, um, the decision by the Supreme Court in 2013, if I remember the year correctly, uh, gutted uh, much of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. There was called a, a, a prior, um, disclosure prior approval mechanism whereby if any state covered by the Voting Rights Act wanted to amend its law in any way, they would have to get pre-clearance pre from either the Department of, of Justice in Washington, D.C. or a federal district court before they, before they could amend their state law, right? The Supreme Court struck that down. Um, and so uh, that in many ways took the teeth out of the Voting Rights Act. So if we're going to have any, any uh, presumption of that kind of vigilant, uh, Congress would have, to, have to, to amend the Voting Rights Act. But again, you'd have to get simple majorities in both houses uh, and uh, deal with the, with the filibuster in Senate as well, and then get a president to sign that. Maybe after you know, this January 20th, that's a possibility. I don't know. But there have been lots of uh, as we know from the recent history in Georgia, for example, with Stacey Abram, Abrams challenges to what happened there in the 2018 gubernatorial race, she charged there were a lot of people who had been disenfranchised, their names had been stricken off uh, the voting rolls uh, for lots, lots of alleged, you know, um, 
uh, dishonesty or what have you. Um, and so um, people had to re-register there and had to be very vigilant about protecting their themselves. So it's, it's a continuing struggle that you know, citizens have to be alert to and have to actively uh, make sure that they're registered to vote and they exercise their franchise. And I think as the more recent changes in Georgia have, have demonstrated, when there's a call to arms, people can overcome even those very consequential challenges that they're faced there and that exist in other states as well. Does the court focus on religious liberty, um, it, is that um, partly due to the kind of categories of equal protection that you talked about earlier that that is that is well, no, it has to do because again, there there are these liberty clauses within the First Amendment. So again, Congress will make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That's what. There's also a piece of federal legislation from the 1990s that they rely on to a certain degree as well. But there are separate um, separate constitutionally based religious protections that, in many ways, the court may now seek to enhance. From the First Amendment. So again, if you have questions for Professor Pinello, please uh, email them to pthompson at stbarts.org or you can put them into the live chat on YouTube or the comments on Facebook. Um, we have a question about um, any influence the Japanese internment camps might have had on the interpretations of the equal protection in the 1950s, if at all. Well, interestingly enough, um, that case was only recently overruled in the past 10 years by the United States Supreme Court. In fact, uh, Korematsu versus the United States was the name of the case from 1943, where the Supreme Court basically said we're going to turn, to turn away during this time of, of national crisis uh, from these, this, this, these equality concerns. Um, and again, that remained good constitutional law until just the past the decade. But that, that case and, and the, the theories behind it have been so uniformly condemned over the decades, and rightfully so, that um, I, I, I would be surprised, at least in a sane constitutional context today, if that exists anywhere in a reliable way, that that, that really is a relic of history. Um, and again, that and, and bear in mind that the Supreme Court has been described to have discovered the Equal Protection Clause in Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, right? Which was more than a decade after Korematsu from 1943. Um, again, from the Cole Grove case I talked about from 1946, the majority opinion by being of Felix France, Frankfurt who never mentioned the 14th Amendment, right? So it really wasn't until Brown in 1954 that the Supreme Court kind of latched on to the Equal Protection Clause as a source of constitutional power and authority. And indeed, in the 1960s, Cole Grove was changed. There was something called the reapportionment revolution based now upon the court's belief in equal protection so that uh, by the mid 1960s, the Supreme Court or ordered uh, one person, one vote across all states. So by the end of the 1960s, all state legislatures had been, re been reapportioned based upon population, as well as the United States House of Representatives in terms of congressional uh, districts. So again, the one legislative chamber in the, in, in, the, in the nation that is not currently apportioned by population is the United States Senate, because it's, it's, the, it's the exception pursuant to Article I of the Constitution. But yeah, equality was discovered by the Supreme Court in 1954, and in many ways has been uh, you know, recognized and, and honored uh, by that court uh, when it had not been before. And why do you think that is that the court ignored the Equal Protection Clause for so long? Because it had been a very conservative court uh, up until uh, the 1930s. Uh, as you may know, in fact, the Supreme Court attacked Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal in 1935 and 36. And there was this court packing plan that Roosevelt proposed in 1937 because the so-called nine old men on the court had none of them, you know, kicked a bother, kicked a bucket, or or, or retired from the courts. So during his first four years as president, he had no opportunity to make an appointment of the court. He was very frustrated 
because they were striking down various provisions of the uh, New Deal. And so it took, a, it took a while for the court to reach a more modern era because uh, prior to the 1930s, it basically had been protecting business interests and repressing federal power, in effect. We, we do have a question about federalism and the, the um, move away from states' rights. And if you can talk about um, that, that movement and its relationship to, to guaranteeing equality. Is, is, is equality um, kind of necessary, necessarily linked with increasing federalism? Um, it, it depends, it depends. So if we talk about this recent example of the Bostic case, for example, where as of a year ago, there were 22 of the 50 states that pursuant to their own public accommodations laws included sexual orientation or um, uh, gender expression or, uh, or equality, right? Um, there were 28 that did not. So a gay person in, in, in Georgia or in Texas or a trans person in Florida or whatever the state might have been, could have been fired from their jobs merely because of their status, right? The Supreme Court's Bostic decision from last June changed that based upon its interpretation of a federal statute. It wasn't even the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment that was an issue in that case, right? So it was a federal statute that Congress passed all the way back in 1964. But again, almost half of the states, as of a year ago, had reached the point of on their own, providing that kind of quality provision. So one of, the, one of the attributes that's potentially positive about our complicated system of federalism, that if you, if you lose in one place, you can oftentimes go to another place and succeed, right? Think about marriage equality, for example. As I talked about, you know, Congress passed the Defense of Marriage Act in 1996, three years after Hawaii suggested that based upon the Hawaii constitution, same-sex couples might get married in that state, although they never did before 1996. The mere suggestion caused this nationwide backlash, right? And then shortly thereafter, starting Vermont with civil unions and then Massachusetts with marriage outright in 2003 and things percolated around the country. And then finally the Supreme Court in the last decade decided to nationalize that. So I, I think one of the one of the attributes that it can be very positive is that there are lots of places to go um, in, in a complicated system. Um, so I, I offered Canada as kind of this shining star concerning its Charter of Rights and Freedoms from 1982. But before 1982 in Canada, there wasn't a lot nationwide at all. Indeed, the only reason, the only reason that happened in 1982 is because Quebec threatened to secede because they had all these problems based upon language in Canada between you know, French and English and whatnot. And so that's why the Canadian Charter was finally uh, uh, ratified. And most of it has to do with the linguistic issue, not, 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 not other kinds of equality issues, right? But, but that's a much more modern example of what equality understanding represents. And we have reached that through fits and starts and other kinds of ways through our, our own complicated system of federalism. But again, the constitution on its face is substantially flawed. And, and we're stuck with that sadly, because it's so difficult to amend the constitution. Again, to change it formally in terms of passing an amendment, you have to get super majorities in Congress, two thirds in both the house and the Senate. When do you ever get two thirds to in either the house or the Senate on any issue, let alone a constitutional amendment? then you have to get three quarters of the states. You have to get 38 of the 50 states to agree as well to ratify a constitutional amendment, right? That's an exceedingly difficult hurdle. The other option is having a constitutional convention. But in 230 plus years worth of history, since our original constitution was ratified, there has never been a constitutional convention in this country. So as a practical matter, we're stuck with the electoral college, we're stuck with the Senate, we're stuck with these other problems and we have to deal with them as best we can. There was a question about amendments and the extent to which that could 
could help further the cause of equality with without amendments is court packing a a, a possible option that well yes as, as fdr originally again he had this court packing panel all the way back in 1937 but again under the constitution under article three which regulates the courts all, all, all the Constitution says about the Supreme Court, for example, and it's very, it's very odd because the, the framers had a lot to say about the Congress. It spent like, you know, two or 3,000 words talking about Congress, and it talked about the president, and it spent about uh, 1,000 words talking about the president. But finally, when the framers got around to the courts in Article Three, they had about six or 700 words, and all they said about the Supreme Court was this. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court. Period. That's all I said. It was an afterthought, right? And they said everything else about inferior courts, you know, the lower courts, should be left up to Congress to regulate. So Congress has the power to regulate the courts. So we, we've had nine justices on the Supreme Court since the Civil War. Before that, there were as few as six. There were as many as ten at one point, right? all subject to congressional regulation. So yes, if we could get through Congress a new law, as again, FDR had proposed back in the 1930s to increase, you know, the court's membership, say, to, I don't know, 13, add four new seats, right? And guess who would, guess would appoint those, right? After this coming Wednesday, that would be a way of, 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 of changing, you know, the kind of shenanigans that, um, that Mitch McConnell did in the past four years in terms of judicial appointments, um, if if people wanted a more um, progressive body there, but again, it would have to be passed by Congress first. And with the Senate, you know, with, with split now with 50-50 votes between the parties and the vice president breaking ties, and the filibuster looming there as well, that's not likely in the foreseeable future. It's simply not a political prospect. Theoretically, it is. But the probability is not it's not high. Well, unfortunately, we have to stop soon. There's a final question about um, actions or non-actions of the U.S. courts being taken during this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, will they will they reach the Supreme Court at all? Um, any issues regarding? To well, that, again, the Supreme Court did make that very superficial decision with regard to a, a plan that came here from New York State, saying that. Uh, religious houses can only allow what was 25 or 50 people, whatever it is, when bars and restaurants could have had more, something like that. The court at that point stepped in and said, no, sorry, you can't do that. But that was in an extreme circumstance. And also, by the time the court's decision had become moot. But I think it was the court kind of putting people on notice that it was, it was prepared to hear those kinds of claims. And do you so, think there will be some in the, in the coming months? Yeah, oh, yes. Yes, I'm sure that, again, given the current composition of the court, there'll be lots of claims based upon those religion clauses from the First Amendment, and also perhaps based upon statutory provisions from, from people seeking those kinds of religious liberties. I have no doubt about that at all. How they will end up, I'm not entirely sure, but I'm sure there'll be a flood of such lit litigation in the foreseeable future. Well, unfortunately, we do have to stop there. Thank you so much, Professor Pinello, um, our very own, for, for taking the time to be with us this morning for this deep dive into the Constitution and its amendments um, as we uh, continue to think about um, what we can do to further equality in our, in our country and around the world. So, so thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. It's been my pleasure. Take care. Thank you all for watching. Please join us for worship at 11 a.m.